towards a sociogenic methodological research framework in Western classical European music composition research by Jamie Diaz. Abstract. In this article, I will share the emerging intersectional methodological framework I have developed for my PhD project at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, the project titled A Violent Accumulation of Identifications Composing In, Through, With the Latino X Diaspora, includes a portfolio of compositions, narrative portraits of seven Latina, Latino, and Latina X part participants, and a 40,000 word dissertation. The framework is steeped in the black and brown feminist epistemologies and ontologies of Sylvia Winter, Patricia Hill Collins, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, and Edgar Rodriguez Doran, and I also weave into this neuroqueer and disabled perspectives. This approach developed organically alongside the PhD project in order to investigate Latino X sound artists' use and non-use of their identities in their creative practice. Identities including, but not limited to, race, parenthood, gender, disability, sexuality, hobbies, etc. And in particular, to evaluate dialectical tensions some artists may be experiencing. In her work, Winter, 2001, via Fanon, writes that sociogenic may be a type of framework that can perhaps bridge the gap between biology, specifically phylogeny and ontogeny, and the social cultural fields. Winter develops this idea further and specifies that sociogeny should be rooted in the study of words, in effect the study of the rhetoricity of our human identity, and that it needs to happen in liminal transcultural spaces by a min minoritarian subject from a minoritarian perspective. It is from here that I make my case for a black-brown feminist sociogenic methodological research framework to study our own minoritarian and or global majority South lived experiences within the fields of Western European classical music, which I'll refer to as Weckham, and computer music. The pre preliminary findings of my PhD suggest that some Weckham and computer music sound artists may experience a type of forced epistemic self-harm as their identifications are stripped away through the construction of a work due to white effective mechanisms. The methodological framework presented here then may help in rethinking our creative research and pedagogical practices in Wacom and computer music. Just a little content warning, I'll talk about racism, white supremacy, ableism, PTSD, and abuse. Introduction. I start this article with a quote from Jacqueline Rose. I quote, Identities that flounder are the bearers of psychic truth. They bear witness both to the infinite complexity of psychic life and to our deepest implication of the ills of the world through which we must continue to struggle. Only if you confront the mess of things, delve beneath the surface, let in the silence voices of history clamoring at the gate, is there the slightest prospect of understanding, let alone transforming the nightmares of our contemporary world? End quote. In this article, I share the emerging intersectional methodological framework and methods I have developed for my PhD project at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. The project, titled A Violent Accumulation of Identifications Composing In Through With the Latino X Diaspora, includes a portfolio of compositions, narrative portraits of seven Latina, Latino, and Latinx participants, and a 40,000 word thesis. Side note, when I say Latino X, I'm abbreviating Latina, Latino, and Latinx all into one. In short, the project is mainly concerned with the mess of things sound artists in the Latinidad face when engaging with creative practices through what George E. Lewis calls urological frameworks. More specifically, I am interested in what occurs as we become more aware of the I quote, collectively held Latino X sense of self that shapes, end quote, each of our pra creative practices. 
This stems directly from Winter's work where she developed a sociogenic philosophy on the development of black consciousness that occurs within, I quote, the aberration of affect induced in the black by the massive psycho-existential complex in which they find themselves entrapped. She writes further, seeing that because all modes of human conscious experience and thereby of consciousness can now be seen to be in all cases, the expression of the culturally constructed mode of subjective experience specific to the functioning of each culture's sociogenic sense of self, the same recognition can now be analogically extrapolated to the species-specific sense of self, expressing the genomic principle defining of all forms of organic life. End quote. Here, Winter makes an argument for how racial metastructures within various cultures can and do affect the development of one's consciousness, and she gives examples in her chapter that include a case of Western anti-black colonialism and a case of black autophobia within a Congolese context and the fear of albino skin. Parker describes this as, I quote, how a body perceives itself in racial terms, reliance, on a comparison with other bodies matters fundamentally not only to a person's living but to the character of the life of the species from fanon's awakening of how the colonial black other had been inscribed on his skin and psyche winter expands sociogeny to the study of black consciousness rooted in that moment of awakening it is from here that i depart and build on fanon and winter's philosophy and many others to explore the sense of self, the Latino X consciousness of composers and computer musicians, whom I collectively refer to sound artists in this article at times. The primary research questions I engaged in the project with are, one, what are the experiences of Latino X sound artists like in Wacom composition and computer music? Two, how do our identifications uh, inform our practice, if at all, and vice versa. Three, if identities and the mediums are interacting in some way with each other, what are the processes or mechanisms that instigate and affect these interactions? What are the consequences? I chose a methodological framework and mixed methods with roots in black and brown sociology, critical race theory, and black feminist thought to explore these questions because what is being investigated is not a static phenomena. Both the act of making music and identification may be understood as fluid social phenomena that may change depending on many factors. Therefore, I felt it necessary to build a framework that could use music composition, whether acoustic and or electronic, as a tool of narrative research that, I quote, explores the dynamics and constructions of the meaning Latino X sound artists make of their lives. Additionally, as Ozias notes by Chase, I quote, the sociologically oriented narrative inquiry, end quote, allows me to focus, I quote, on the larger oppressive meta narratives and possibilities for social change, end quote, within Wacom composition and computer music. When I began the project in 2021, I had not yet defined the methodology because I wanted to form one organically through the portfolio's development and the interview process. The inclusion of interviews was only confirmed at the end of my first year and as a consequence of questions I received at conference presentations. In these presentations, I spoke about the restrictions of staff-based notation I had encountered in my career. For example, when I used mariachi pitch logics or mariachi screams in a composition, Often my cultural and racial aspects of the composition were stripped away when performed by white performers. See Diaz 2016 and 2023. While my presentations focused on issues I faced because of my identifications in queerness, brownness, and neurodivergence, I was asked by white audience members to talk about issues white and white adjacent composers face and I believe this happened because people wanted me to expand the scope of my study to include white people. This was upsetting primarily because 
I was being asked to think through uh, a white racial frame, see Yule 2023, for white people. In one instance, I was asked to speak about how Scottish folk composers may face the same issues I face. My response was that although the issues, issues may be the same, how the issues are experienced is completely are completely different due to one's identifications and their relation to the white supremacist capitalist hetero patriarchy. Sea Hooks, 1997. The encounter between a white Scottish folk musician and staff based notation will not be experienced as oppression because white people are not oppressed in our current Western white hegemonic social economic society. See footnote three. Footnote 3, I write just a bit about historic laws in Scotland that attempted to ban Gallic language and culture. So though I recognize that there have been oppressive situations that Scottish community, Scottish white communities have faced, these have been nowhere near as hostile and oppressive as European colonialism and imperialism have been against black African and indigenous people throughout West Central Africa, but also in India, China, obviously the Americas for hundreds of years. And today, Gallic language and culture organizations actually receive quite a bit of money from the Scottish government to support their programs and schools. There's a college that's going to be open soon in Glasgow. And of course, reparations have yet to be paid, whether through cultural institutions or um, directly to the black communities and individuals, um, you know, from the Scottish government. So there's just, just, just a note of that. I realize through these presentations, I could embed forms of resistance into the methodology and methods, helping me to counter questions that seek to submit me into a white racial frame. I accomplish this by turning the project into a narrative-based inquiry and by focusing on my own community's realities. I asked the participants of my study to speak about their experiences by using their Latino X identity as the primary site of inquiry. Similar to Fanon and to how Fanon and Winter focus on that moment of awakening, of black awakening, I see this as an act of resistance against the white supremacist meta narratives and as a way to focus the research and its reception on what it is like to be brown, just as Winter writes what it is like to be black. I am ultimately asking for what intersectional brown consciousness, joy, oppression, etc., etc., in Wecom and computer music looks like today for the participants and myself. What happens when we compose or code in through with our Latino X identity? From my own creative practice and through informal conversations I've had with other BIPOC artists and academics, I began to theorize that the structures of Wecom music composition and computer music may be acting as a filter. If we begin to understand the various mediums we use to organize sound with, whether notation, code, or DAWs, and if we understand these as an active rather than neutral media object with a capacity to absorb societal anxieties, see Jameson, 1979, then we can perhaps begin to see that the mediums are never neutral and may interact and affect our identities in various ways. Interviews, rhetoricity, are then key to providing evidence of this from multiple perspectives. In addition to exploring the relationship between Latino X identification and creative practices, I am also concerned with how white effective tech Technologies, see Leonardo uh, and, and Zembilas 2013, may be embedded in our mediums in order to reproduce 19th century and contemporary white, middle, and upper class values and modes of social control, see Bull 2019, and the epistemic quagmires and or violence that may occur. These mediums have been historically hyper encoded by and for the European white cis het man. It will be important to note the cumulative effect our industry's epistemic ignorance and discrimination has had on our individual practices, what it is like for Latina parents to exist in Wecom, what is it like to be disabled in Latino X in our industries, what it is like to compose as a trans Latina person in our industry.
what is it what is it like to have to code in english which may be your second language what is it like to have to submit to u.s digital imperialism in order to participate in a field these encounters may then lead to some artists experiencing dialectical tensions as they become more aware of their identifications how the white racial frame in Wecom perceives them and the collective health sense of self that arises from living within the totalizing negativity in relation see Parker page 444 this negativity in relation is something participants described in their stories through their struggles with diaspora identification as well as uh, issues with gender identification. Some express not feeling American or Mexican or Puerto Rican enough. This is what leads to an identification based on a constant negative definition within the Latino X context. From this, there may be, for example, a forced distance placed between an individual and their Latino X identities to assimilate into the white composer ideal. The preliminary findings of my PhD suggest that some Latino ex Wacom and computer music artists may experience a type of forced epistemic self-harm as their identifications are stripped away through the construction of a work, through their identifications development, and thereby through the development of their Latino ex consciousness. This has very specific implications for how and why we should rethink our creative research and pedagogical practices. Below, I will first provide a brief overview of white affective neutrality in Wacom composition and computer music. This will contextualize my decision to use the methodological framework I have built. Then I will expand on the methodology and methods of the project before finishing with pre preliminary results. I am thankful to all the scholars whose work I have engaged with and who have laid the foundations for me to do my work. Literature review. White affective neutrality in Wecom composition and computer music. One of the starting startling findings I have witnessed in the interview data for my study is the commonality of white affective mechanisms amongst the participants' stories. Some of the participants will recognize discrimination and name whiteness as a phenomena that has impacted their career in one way or another. And it is not just in a negative way, as some participants have articulated benefiting from whiteness in circumstances where they had to assimilate, though the process of assimilation was itself described in the negative. Regardless of the type of experience the sound artist had, behind these events are cultural mechanisms, social codes that often signal moral white superiority and are used to differentiate oneself from the BIPOC musical other. To grasp the participants' sense of self and their identifications through their Latino X identity, it is first crucial to comprehend what white affective neutrality and affect are in order to understand the significant impact it has on their identifications and creative endeavors, and to understand it within the Wacom and computer music context. Quote unquote, why effective neutrality, as defined by Leonardo Zimbalas, is a phrase that is useful in describing how whiteness through affect maintains white supremacist racial structures through the manipulation, protection, and vigilance of the white racial self and its pureness. I quote, effective technologies include the mechanisms through which affects and emotions come to be instrumentalized, containing certain social norms and dynamics of inclusion, exclusion, with respect to one's self and an other, page 151, end quote. The authors make a distinction here between affect and emotion and write, I quote, emotion may be understood as more discursive, more aligned to semantic and semiotic signification. Affect, by contrast, may be understood as less discursive, less available to signification, and more pertaining to the body. Page 162, end quote. Different quote. By understanding the operation of whiteness as effective technology that maintains certain norms and structures, we are provided with an important linkage among embodiment, affectivity, and whiteness. This enables us to consider the interconnections of bodily whiteness and the symbolic whiteness of social and discursive structures such as race dialogue or in Wacom the programming of all white male concerts for example. 
What this means is that exclusion, objection, hatred, and other emotions about non-white individuals are at once embodied, effective, and socially produced. Whiteness, then, must be approached as a function of effective modes of constitution and affirmation through the systemic generation of disqualified, abject, non-white individuals. See Hook, 2005, page 160, end quote. Through these mechanisms, whites and white adjacent people can position themselves, their culture, customs, etc. as neutral and distance themselves from being labeled as racist, avoiding racial dialogue, all while reproducing white supremacist structures and behaviors. An example of this, again, would be um, all white and or all male programming, for example, concert programming. An example of white effective technologies includes um, when a person clutches their purse as a black or brown person walks by them. Another is when a person locks their car door as a blacker person walks by the car. These actions are presented to us as neutral actions of safety when in reality there is no danger. The actions are the consequences of white cultural norms and are used to distinguish between one's white self and the black or brown other. Keep in mind that one does not need to have white skin in order to act white and or to use white effective technologies and mechanisms. Below I will describe various ways white effective neutrality and affect manifest in Wacom and computer music. Zobilis and Nigerauer, 2017, page 43, write in their book that when asked about their education and process, the white composers they interviewed, quote, find themselves in a culturally hyper-encoded referential space, which is structured in part by the canon and in part by morals, and which they view with varying degrees of ambival ambivalence, end quote. This hyper-encoded space that sound artists find themselves in operates within what Hooks 1997 called the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. These white sociological, political, economic, and cultural structures have affected the fields of Wacom and computer music by privileging what scholars have defined as the white male gaze, see Armitage and Thornham 2021, or the white racial frame, see Yule 2023. In both Wacom and computer music, this has resulted in the long-held belief that music is a white, masculine, and intellectual activity that is pursued in silence. See Avaniemi, 2022, Armitage and Thornham, 2021, and Macmillan, 2022. This white approach has stripped physical, social, cultural, and political concerns from the act of making music. I do not claim that these entire fields are inherently in whiteness. However, I do argue that enough of it is controlled by white effective neutrality to warrant the development of studies and unique research methodologies to understand the whiteness of the hyper-encoded referential space we work in. Many of the participants in my study talked about how the act of writing or learning music is simultaneously a constructive and destructive activity. Most participants express joy about their practice or about how much they love learning Wacom and computer music histories and techniques. While the process of writing may be joyful, some participants also spoke about types of physical and epistemic self-harm because of how their identifications are stripped away and are restricted through the work, construction of a work, or from specific structures and notation and computer music. Behind the epistemic self-harm is the white effective mechanisms within Wacom and computer music, which I will expand on in the findings section. Another effect of whiteness in our fields can be witnessed through white canon fundamentalism in contemporary orchestral programming statistics. See Deemer Meals 2022, Gendered Programming and Discrimination, see Doolittle 2018, and through what Yule 2023 has identified as Wacom Music Theory's white racial frame. As a result of these white structures, the creative practices of marginalized sound artists have been largely understood through a white male gaze and its implied and or inherent a politicalness, a socialness, and a culturalness. Yule makes an unassailable argument that music theory pedagogy and research in the U.S. has relied heavily on white composers and music theorists, which has caused a severe generational epistemic ignorance of the music and theories from BIPOC cultures. Page is 82 to 97. 
This epistemic ignorance, I argue, is foundational to the construction of white effective mechanisms in Wacom and in computer music. As I shall share below, when whiteness positions itself in a state of neutrality or universality, it becomes almost impossible to challenge. I hope that by showing the mess of things Latino Exxon artists confront in their practice, we can begin to understand the silent hostility we face and its possible effects on us. An all-white male concert program syllabi or textbook may not seem like an act of racism or white supremacy, but it is a form of epistemic exclusion, ignorance, and violence. Yule writes, I quote, Thus, what can be known is defined by white propertied men. Their moral status was equalized in the sense that, in pre-modernity, white propertied men could easily be any number of rungs below the nobility or the church, while with modernity such men became equals. And it is precisely these white men who, in the 19th century, when our American music institutions were beginning, like the New York Phil in 1842, the Met Opera in 1883, the Peabody Institute 1857, New England Conservatory 1867, and Yale School of Music 1894, um, defined what was meant to be studied and performed in these institutions. In other words, what was proper to know. Page 83. End quote. Although I may have to speculate about certain aspects of white effective mechanisms in Wacom composition and computer music, Yule provides an excellent analysis and framework for how white supremacy and colonialism in Wacom, and by extension computer music, created a pedagogical practice of perpetual epistemic ignorance. This pattern of ignorance is what in part has entrenched these fields within white effective neutrality which actively suppresses the musical epistemologies and ontologies of marginalized creators. I ask, via Sharp 2016 and Beltran 2020, how might these acts of suppression and exclusion be necessary for the survival of the current white supremacist structures in Wacom and computer music? Do people really care? James Millen 2022 gave a talk at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, the notion of silence within a composer's practice and its relation to religious silence or God's silence, quote unquote. He encouraged us all to live in silence and to listen for it. I questioned him about this and asked him about composers who may struggle with intrusive thoughts, may have more than two jobs, or are apparent in silence, as described by Macmillan, just is not something they can genuinely experience. Macmillan's response was that he had no comment on this. His understanding of silence, I would argue, is why ableist and privilege. See Coinet 2020, Demesio 20, 2003. Silence, as Macmillan described it, is simply something that is not attainable by many different kinds of people, including some of the participants of my study and me. He constructs the compositional practice as something that happens alone, in solitude, and in silence. Rebecca Sophia Eveniemi, 2022, via Lydia Gower, notes that, quote, the norms and expectations that are still associated with classical music today, these being the practices around composing, performing, and listening to a musical work, end quote, can be traced back to 19th century right romantic notions, page 159. I argue these norms and expectations are at the heart of Wacom's white effective neutrality, we are asked to assimilate into them through the act of composing, the pedagogy of Wacom, and the professional industry itself. The participants' interviews provide ample data to support this argument, and I will share excerpts of one narrative portrait in the later section. When we explore what silence, composition, and race means through an intersectional lens, we can begin to understand how silence is racialized in certain times and spaces where, quote, the branding of racial and religious minorities as loud is a common prejudicial trope, end quote. See Wagner, 2018. Silence and whiteness have also been, quote, rendered neutral in Western culture, end quote, which then creates a, quote, myth of white silence that forces Americans to consider who has to explain themselves and who has the right to remain silent, end quote. See Cognette, 2020. 
Hakoen, 2013, traces a similar myth of white oral supremacy in her book, The Music Label Against the Jews. I quote, as a historical categorization of the Jew as a producer of noise in a Christian universe conceived of as dominated by harmonious sounds, end quote, page 11. Koinia makes further connections to how white silence dominates the surroundings and has ties to the notion of mastery. This is how I argue that Macmillan's definition of silence is a white effective technology itself with the subconscious aim of controlling the bodies of BIPOC composers. The connection between white silence and mastery of one's environment in Macmillan's practice, further exacerbated by the connection he made between religion and silence and assuming that we all have complete control of our environmental, psychological, social, and economic surroundings, begins to reveal for me a compositional practice deeply tied to colonialism, the slave master relationship, and the contemporary white supremacist capitalist heteropatriarchy. From another point of view, Steedman 2011 explores a theoretical framework to understand a historical, quote, concept and practice of political autonomy centered on a notion of mastery, which is inextricably linked to race, gender, and class hierarchy. He writes that during the years of 1880 to 1910, Atlanta was a place where Southern progressives used systematic tactics to civilize the recently freed slaves. White Southern progressives thought that, quote, under the guidance of a paternalistic state, black Southerners might, over a sufficiently long time span, be brought to the level of civilization whites were thought already to have achieved. Page 341. It is important to note that white effective mechanisms, though subtle, are a long-term project of white supremacy, assimilation, and oppression. We do not have this language or knowledge in Wekamer computer music, and this is the main reason I have sought the discourses of other fields in my study. Of course, as we shall see further below, the civility white Southerners wanted to impart never included to true equality, but instead what Beltran 2020 has argued as being a Herrenvolk democracy, which relies on the oppression of BIPOC people for it to sustain itself, for white democracy to sustain itself. There are many similarities between a Herrenvolk democracy and the hierarchies and systems of power we have in Wekum and computer music. It is beyond the scope of this article to tease out these notions, but they are further explored in my PhD thesis. I ask again, how are oppression or exclusion in Weka necessary to uphold its current white supremacist structures? Joanna Ward, in her article Redefining Compositional Practices Under Contemporary Capitalism, reviews several notions of the tortured, of, I quote, the tortured genius trope often applied to historical white composers, end quote. Ward traces how the separation between intellectual and emotional labor was connected to masculinity and femininity, femininity, respectively, because composition was seen as a white male intellectual labor. Women and other racial minorities were excluded from Wekum, I quote, where mental capacity is held to be a white masculine trait and therefore white femininity in oppositional definition is attached to the body and feeling, end quote. Ward notes that this Cartesian dualism, quote, led to a situation where composer geniuses are conceptualized as a mind only, end quote, completely erasing the body and the physical labor from the composition discourse, as well as the physical labor needed to make time for composing, such as the cooking and cleaning. Because of this, the body is simply ignored, quote, end quote. This is another example of how the white racial frame has in Wekum composition position itself within a neutral and universal reality, which should, in theory, be accessible to anyone regardless of identifications. But statistics of BIPOC orchestral programs and PhD students suggest that this type of compositional practice that dismisses the social and physical concerns of a person is inherently inaccessible to many. Composition as historically defined, pushes us toward the tortured genius trope with very little acknowledgement of contemporary oppressive modes. 
but we can see evidence of these modes outside of Wacken through statistics such as the lower graduation rates of BIPOC students in the U.S. See National Center for Education Statistics 2019. The higher BIPOC infant mortality rate of BIPOC patients seen by white doctors. See Greenwood 2020. Racist hiring practices. See racism still plays huge part in the employment market. 2023 and the BIPOC pay gap with their uh, compared to their white co-workers see fraud et al 2023 many of the participants of this study shared stories of how their mental and physical health has affected their creative process through Ward's main question in her article we can begin to reconceptualize what it means to be a latino x sound artist Ward writes I quote, what would a model of compositional practice, which was inherently profoundly and radically accessible to anyone, look like, end quote. She notes different ways a composer can refuse, quote, on a personal level in order to explore a practice that is more accessible. Ward, for example, draws scores on an iPad, which makes the, quote, physical process of score making more flexible and less physically demanding, end quote. She recycles musical material project to project, reducing research and development time and the overall workload. She allowed herself to, quote, create more intuitively without the analytical justifications which we are taught are necessary to make work good and legitimate, end quote. An intersectional lens, however, may reveal key differences in how these are experienced in practice between Ward's whiteness and the participant's Latino X identity. An iPad may be out of several participants' budgets, but paper and pencil can be substituted, though this will change the aspect of the physical. Embracing recycled material and letting go of the analytical foundations we were taught may end in a Latina OX composer being labeled as lazy or stupid and seen as exploiting an opportunity. Although Ward makes valid points, Resistance in everyday life may affect people with different identities in distinct and often hostile ways. Resistance in and of itself, I would argue, can be a privileged activity, depending on many circumstances. If we were to increase resistance in any one aspect of our creative practices, we would be challenging the very space, the very cage of the diaspora, that the white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy has allowed us to exist in. In other words, white normativity constructs a perception of Latino X people as always having to work harder than their white counterparts, otherwise we are labeled lazy. Historical examples suggest that if any of the Latino X participants of this study use similar tactics as Ward, it may lead to them being perceived as lazy or stupid within the industry rather than an act of resistance, an intellectual labor, see Flores 1941. Similar to how second wave feminism ignored what feminism meant to black and brown women, see Moraga and Anzaldúa 2015, and in particular black, queer, and trans women, I want to ask how Ward's question, which is asked from a privileged white perspective, can be applied to the experiences of Latino OX sound artists. How can we resist without risking our already precarious positions within Wacom and Computer Music's white racial frame? And is it about resisting or is it about overcoming the white effective mechanisms? And if so, how? Can resistance in our creative practices be a white effective mechanism? And is it about resistance or is about or is it about inviting white people to dismantle whiteness and to interrogate the philosophy of whiteness? Coloniality and its effects on marginalized artists in Wacom and computer music has been studied by several scholars. These studies focus on how coloniality continues to negatively affect collaborations between Wacom Institution and BIPOC artists, see Pierre Baye and Atadiwala 2018 or Ross 2020, how black and indigenous artists' creative practices and careers are affected by coloniality, see Yule 2020, Kendall and Kasedu and Lewis 2021, Lewis and Pulser 2020, Robbins 2023, and Robbins in 2020, and how identity formation is still shaped by it, see Darmu 2019 and Salman 2017. Darmu notes that the new music scene in Quebec is culturally 
I quote, homogenous and predominantly white. People of color or indigenous people who self-identify as part of the scene tend to employ an artistic discourse that serves, caters to, or is compatible with the dominant culture's perspectives or interests. Cultural differences tend to be assimilated, adapted, or reformatted to better fit the genre's white definitions and boundaries. Page 3. Also, I added the word white there. Relevant to this study is Dormu's argument and first-hand observation of how BIPOC Wickham artists assimilate to serve the, quote, homogenous and predominantly white field. He notes that within Wickham, merit is attributed, quote, based on how the scene senses and understands it, which in turn are based on dominant culture's own ways of sensing and understanding it. Page 12. Dharmu points out that the dominant culture may be affecting BIPOC artists passively. This is one of the main reasons for using a mixed methods approach for my study to fully grasp how identity may be affecting the participants' practices and vice versa. We need to investigate their music from their perspective with interviews and have a strong understanding of their practice and cultural context. This will allow us to see how they define their sense of self in their practice and how their identities interact with this, if at all, amongst the white Wacom spaces. Both Veni Emmy and Ward note that the historical definition of a composer has ignored aspect of a composer's body and social world. Composing has historically been masculine and conceptual type of labor. Interviews allow for the practice of composition to be situated and contextualized, recontextualized from that white historical perspective to within the unique intersectional realities of the Latino X participants. By using the methodology I have designed, we may then be able to understand the mechanisms by which white affective neutrality operates within Wacom and computer music. If we can understand how these mechanisms operate and how they interact with our practices, we may then be able to build a more equitable creative practice where one does not face epistemic violin exclusion or erasure. Though this would also depend on massive changes within the field, so baby steps. This methodology then is not dependent on substituting, for example, white European excellence for Mexican excellence. It is not a methodology based on the need for greater representation of Latina or ex artists, though that's always a good thing. Rather, this methodology actively calls for the restructuring of what we do and how we do it. A reimagining of our world without performative solidarity and EDI policies. It is here that I invoke Munoz's term futurity from his book Cruising Utopia, the then and there of queer futurity. Munoz writes, queerness, I quote, queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desire that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. The here and now is a prison house we must strive in the face of and the here and now's totalizing rendering of reality to think and feel a then and there. Some will say that all we have are the pleasures of this moment, but we must never settle for that minimal transport. We must dream and enact new and better pleasures, other ways of being in the world, and ultimately new worlds. Queerness is a longing that propels us onward, beyond the romances of the negative and toiling in the present. Page one, end quote. Many of the black and brown feminist thinkers I cite below are similar sentiment about using art, have similar sentiments about using art and or research to imagine a better future. Dr. Jaipri Verdi, 2024, recently further developed futurity by asking us to imagine a deaf futurity in which disability is not something that needs to be cured. Verdi asked, what happens when we stop stigmatizing disability and start seeing beauty and difference? She argues for a type of research framework that is reflexive, having the capacity to center different marginalized perspectives when needed, and asks us to reframe how we think about disability in such a way that we begin to, quote, wrap the varied auditory spectrum into the fabric of everyday life. Disability is everyday life. How can we begin to wrap the varied Latino X spectrum of identifications into the fabric of everyday life of Wacom and computer music? I firmly ground my emerging methodology in through with their work as I attempt to reimagine a better industry 
not just for Latino X artists, but for all fellow BIPOC artists. Below, I break down the various influences and parts of the methodological framework and how I have applied it in practice. I will break down the epistemological and ontological assumptions, then I will review the research paradigm and finish with the beliefs underpinning the methodology. I will also provide a short overview of the methods. Through this, I hope to communicate a sense of urgency for why we need more research projects in sound art using similar methodologies in order to further dismantle the white universalist portrait Wacom and computer music have situated themselves in, not least because of the rising authoritarianism throughout our societies and the dismantling of universities and home music departments and schools. Methodology and Methods The brief literature review I provided above uses a range of references that aims to connect perspectives that have been ignored in Wacom and computer music but what I find missing in the discourse of Wacom and computer music is a critical intersectional lens capable of confronting not just the white male gaze, but also its affect. Alcoff, 2006, writes, I quote, Social identities are not simply foisted on people from the outside, as it were, but are more properly understood as sites from which we perceive, act, and engage with others. These sites are not simply social locations or positions, but also hermeneutic horizons comprised of experiences, basic beliefs, and communal values, all of which influence our orientation toward and responses to future experiences. Page 287, end quote. From this, I postulate about what a white identity is in Wacom and computer music, and whether more white artist researchers should be wrestling with what this means, whether a, quote, philosophy of whiteness is necessary for political and therefore artistic purposes, end quote, see Parker 2018, page 442. And for whites to consider, as Alcoff 2006 writes, I quote, an ever-present acknowledgement of the historical legacy of white identity constructions in the persistent structures of inequality and exploitation, as well as a newly awakened memory of the many white traders to white privilege who have struggled to contribute to the building of an inclusive human community, page 223, end quote. What is white identity's perception its hermeneutic horizons, beliefs, and communal values? What does it mean to perceive, act, and engage through white identity? If this type of reflection was normalized within our artistic and research practices, and we had more white artists, researchers, thinking in through with their whiteness, I wonder what the field would look like now. I wonder what conversations we would be having, and what type of art we would be making. Instead, we have apolitical musical studies, though not all the time, which disconnect themselves from any racial meaning and thereby place themselves within a white universalist portrait. A brief look at composition PhD dissertation titles submitted at Royal, at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland rings familiar white universalist tones. Um, I have a list here. The first reads, Music as Theater, Music as Performance, Six New Works. Walt 2011. Number two, exploration and extension of composition practices, investigations into malleable forms, integral, non-standard instrumentation, and rhythm theory. Foreman 2011. Number three, composition as a creation of a performance, music as a vehicle for non-musical thought. Six new works. Butler 2016. Number four, an investigation through composition of the relationship between stasis, goal direction, and drama. Broom 2016. Number five, a Woman Who Writes Music, A Creative Feminist Autobiography, Hollingworth, 2020. Other submissions not listed are simply titled as Portfolio of Original Compositions. I have been able to access the ones in the list above, and none of them offer a critical analysis of the intersection between their race, identity, and their process, most of which I could confirm are white. To say race is not a part of the studies above is akin to saying that their art is apolitical, Race and every single other identity that any one person or artist above have are phenomena that cannot be turned off like a light switch. Identity cannot be excluded from a musical research investigation 
or an artistic work in the same way a cancer cell can be dissected and analyzed under a microscope separated from its host body. By ignoring the implications whiteness may have had on their practice, these PhDs then sit within a white universalist portrait which carries with it uncommunicated epistemic and ontological assumptions. I do not mean to dismiss any of the above studies that may have focused on rhythm, timbre, or texture, and use these organizing principles to form a type of methodology that is perceived as a political, but rather to illustrate that we simply do not have a robust identification discourse in Wacom composition and computer music, at least at the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, though similar findings are easily found at other places of study in the UK, US, and Canada. Alcuff offers a possible explanation for this pattern of generational exclusion and white ignorance. She writes, quote, As whites lose their psychic social status and as processes of positive identity construction are derailed, intense anxiety, hysteria, shame, and resulting forms of projection and displacement are occurring. Page 221. Essentially, analyzing one's white identity is too much for any one person, as facing it could cons constitute the ultimate white epistemic suicide of the contemporary collective white identity, since, quote, the history of white identity, just as is the case with black American identity or Caribbean identity, South American identity, British identity, and so on, is contemporaneous with European colonialism, page 222. For whites, there is no history, quote, prior to domination, page 222. White death, whether real or epistemic, epistemic exclusion and epistemic violence, have never been normalized in the West. Any attempt to change the perception, quote, that whites collectively are better than non-whites, quote, results in overwhelming anxiety, Alcove, page 221. Sharp, 2016, and Beltran, 2020, conversely argue that BIPOC death is a part of this white anxiety and necessary to uphold white identity, democracy, and cultural hegemony. The literature review above makes the argument that the suppression and exclusion of BIPOC composers is a part of the current white supremacist structures within Wacom. Because of this, I advocate for a brown-specific and black newer queer disabled informed methodological framework that aligns with an intersectional interpretive paradigm and that complements the epistemic and ontological assumptions articulated here. This framework is designed to acknowledge and interrogate the, prem the presence of white supremacy from the very beginning and to center the minoritarian experiences of the Latino X sound artists. Epistemologies and Ontologies. I have borrowed epistemic and ontological assumptions from Patricia Hill Collins, 2020 Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Politics of Empowerment. A primary reason I relied heavily on Collins is that much of her work also describes how my own Mexican American family makes and validates knowledge. While there is no monolithic experience within Latinidad, see Beltran, 2010. There are commonalities that we share amongst our communities, families, and friends regarding knowledge claims. Collins outlines ways that Western and Eurocentric epistemologies are upheld in the U.S. through dominant knowledge validation processes, page 253. In any one field, she writes, quote, Knowledge claims are evaluated by a group of experts whose members bring with them a host of sedimented experiences that reflect their group location in intersecting oppressions. No scholar can avoid cultural ideas and his or her placement in the intersecting oppressions of race, gender, class, sexuality, and nation. In the United States, this means that a scholar making a knowledge claim typically must convince a scholarly community controlled by elite white avowedly heterosexual men holding U.S. citizenship that a given claim is justified. She continues, when elite white men or any other overly homogenous group dominates knowledge validation processes, both of these political criteria can work to suppress black feminist thought. Page 253, end quote. Furthermore, Collins, via Kuhn, 1962, notes that because of widespread notions of black female inferiority, 
New knowledge claims that seem to violate this fundamental assumption are likely to be viewed as anomalies, page 253. I carry these observations by Collins on Eurocentric academia with me and hold them especially close when I am discussing or presenting my research. I have been gaslit in conferences and bullied on social media for sharing some of my thoughts and experiences in Wacom and computer music. I am fully aware that I am Latinx and not Black. I do not claim to have had the experiences Collins has in academia. What I can relate to is the violent assimilation which occurs through the colonizing force of Wacom and computer music and how the elite white, usually heterosexual men in our fields have attempted to dismiss my identifications and knowledge claims. What I have borrowed from Collins is a form of confidence in my own identifications and to be skeptical of when I am labeled a complainer or an anomaly because of my knowledge claims and the claims of the participants. And to always interrogate the epistemic and ontological assumptions underpinning the questions of researchers who seek to label my research as an anomaly. It is through both Collins and Winter's work that I have begun to ask what is brown consciousness in Wacom and computer music, and to think about how one might research this question. I also no longer work or care to convince anyone of the knowledge claims in my work who may identify with the white elite in Wacom or computer music. Instead, I focus on making knowledge in through with my brownness and communities. Once I figured this out, I began to shape the epistemic and ontological assumptions of the study. After criticizing dominant Western epistemologies and ontologies, Collins further defines the ones specific to black feminist thought. Two of these include the importance of lived experience and its impact on what and how black academics research, page 257 to 260, and the use of communal dialogue in assessing knowledge claims, page 260 to 262. Both of these are embedded in my study in different ways. My own lived experience and the encounters I've had in Wacom and computer music informed the formation of my PhD proposal. It was from anecdotal evidence amongst my various communities that I began to suspect staff-based notation and computer music may have inherent systemic issues worthy of a PhD project. These were informed from my experiences as a uh, first-generation Mexican-American, though I identify as mestizic who taught themselves piano before beginning an undergraduate degree in classical piano. Also, not to forget my other identifications in queerness, neurodivergence, and disability. The interviews serve as a site for a communal dialogue between the participants and me. Although I am primarily listening, there is an exchange of knowledge that occurs in the interview, and we assess and recognize our knowledge claims together. From the interviews, I construct a narrative portrait built directly from the transcripts. The narrative portraits are shared individually with each participant ahead of publication so as to ensure I do not misrepresent them. This check and balance system involves more work than a typical methodology which relies solely on a researcher's interpretation of the data, but it is imperative when attempting to resist dominant Western methodologies to accurately contextualize the creative practices of the participants with their social worlds. This also helps to decenter the power I hold as the lead researcher. A third criteria Collins uses is an ethics of caring, which has three separate components. These are, quote, an emphasis placed on individual uniqueness, appropriateness of emotions and dialogues, and developing the capacity for empathy, page 263. I have embedded these components in my approach to interviews and in the data analysis. The project celebrates participants' similarities and differences equally I, in, in their portraits. I attempt to decenter my own experiences, being both a participant researcher, and put an emphasis on the group without dismissing each participant's uniqueness. Each participant will have their own chapter in the thesis chronicling their journey. I have welcomed and made my own emotions and biases clear to the participants and note this in the analysis where relevant. This has become more common in social research where the line between participant researcher is blurred. See Bachu 2019, Rodriguez Doran's 2022, and Lawrence Lightfoot 97. In several of the interviews, participants use the phrase, you know, 
to signal a shared experience or emotion without any need for further explanation. Though in several occasions I have asked the participants to elaborate if there was any sort of ambiguity. I believe that by making room for emotions in the research, we then develop empathy, Colin's third component, not just in the interview session itself, but in the analysis as well. I think that by using empathy in this way as a research tool, I can make the case for the use of this methodology more urgent. One example that has developed organically is that I have had a short gossip session with most of the interviewees after the formal interview is done. We have what we call el chisme or the gossip. Some of them initiated this by asking me, dame el chisme, um, which translates to give me the gossip or spill the tea. Th through um, this, I develop trust and empathy. And finally, within this ethics of care also exists an ethic of personal accountability and how black women are agents of knowledge, page 265 to 269. I have built accountability into the project by sharing the narrative portraits with the participants before publication. I will always be open to critique of the final work, the thesis. This PhD submission will not be the final stage of this work, and I expect for there to be points in the future where I can further develop these ideas with the participants and hopefully um, in larger projects such as a book and commissioning each composer um, to write a piece. I understand that the findings may only be applicable to a specific set of circumstances, set of people, and specific time. The project doesn't seek to explain a universalist Latinidad. While Collins argues for black women as agents of knowledge, my project focuses on how people within Latinidad are agents of knowledge and what this means within the context of Wacom and computer music. Lastly, um, another reason why I was drawn to Collins' work is because some of the participants are multiracial, some of them have black histories and identities, um, the Latinidad identity is complicated, and I um, there was an earlier citation that I gave, Beltran 2010, that's all about Latinidad identity. It's called The Trouble with Unity. Um, check it out if you're interested. But that's, w that's one reason why the methodology sort of has... Uh, influences from black women, brown women, indigenous, um, it's just because the Latinidad diaspora includes so many different identities and backgrounds. Research paradigm. I will now move to the intersectional research paradigm, which encompasses the interpretive framework used to explain social phenomena, page 252, still Collins. I knew from the beginning of the project that I would be investigating identities and their interactions with creative practices. Because of this, I needed a paradigm that could examine what occurs when identities intersect with each other and when these identifications intersect with creative practices, all while assuming that identities and creative practices are social phenomena. I looked to Kimberly Crenshaw's seminal 1989 article, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex where she laid the foundation for a type of analysis that could explain the multidimensionality of black women's oppression in the U.S. judicial system, quote, unquote. This is opposed to a, quote, a single access analysis that distorts and privileges dominant conceptions of discrimination that condition us to think about subordination as disadvantage occurring along a single categorical access. In other words, Crenshaw looked at the consequences that occurred from when blackness intersected womanhood. This approach is relevant to my study because as a research paradigm, intersectionality focuses on how specific encounters are experienced because of one's identifications or combination thereof. This offers a way for us to see the differences in lived experience and break down the historical and contemporary background of the white universalist ideology underpinning Wacom and computer music. In this study, I invited the participants to use their Latino X identity as a site of inquiry through which we would intersect Wacom and computer music. 
The Latino X identity was front and center in the research, and from there, we then began to layer other identities and experiences as they felt like sharing. Some of the layering occurred in the interview, some of this occurred in the analysis, some occurred in the making of the portfolio works in um, my instance, in my, from my perspective. I will use intersectionality in a similar way to tease out the differences that may exist in the data to extrapolate how different forms of Latino X identification may lead to significant differences in one's creative practice, depending on the various forms of oppression or privilege we have in a given moment. Methodological framework. My penultimate task in this section is to share the methodological framework I have built for the project. That is the broad principles of how I will conduct research and how the intersectional interpretive paradigm will be applied. Collins, page 252. Because methodologies are in some form the underpinning theory of how research is to be conducted, I let myself be heavily influenced by influenced by Gloria Anzaldúa's work, Making Face, Making Soul, Haciendo Caras, Creative and Critical Perspective by Feminists of Color, 1990. Anzaldúa writes, quote, Theory originally meant a mental viewing, an idea or mental plan of the way to do something, and a formulation of apparent relationships or underlying principles of certain observed phenomena, which had been verified to some degree. To have theory meant to hold considerable evidence in support of a formulated general principle explaining the operation of certain phenomena. Theory, then, is a set of knowledges. Some of these knowledges have been kept from us. Entry into some professions in academia denied us. Because we are not allowed to enter discourse, because we are often disqualified and excluded from it, because what passes for theory these days is forbidden territory for us, it is vital that we occupy it. By bringing in our own approaches and methodologies, we transform that theorizing space. Page uh, 25, or XXV. Here, Anzal Dua articulates the affect of the accumulation of whiteness and its epistemic ignorance in academia revealing a proclivity for whiteness and the white male gaze. To combat this accumulation of whiteness, which has led to certain, quote, certain methodologies becoming coded as white and or male and thus actively working to disadvantage, Collins, page 297, to disadvantage BIPOC, disabled, and gender minority perspectives. I looked not only to Anzal Dua but, and Collins, but to Daniel... Solorzano and Tara Yoso's article, Critical Race Methodology, Counter Storytelling as an Analytical Framework for Education Research. Their methodology consists of five elements, including the intercentricity of race and racism with other forms of subordination, the challenge, the challenge to dominant ideology, the commitment to social justice, the centrality of experiential knowledge, and the transdisciplinary perspective, page is 25 to 27. My study includes all five of these elements in its methodology, the participants' race and cultural heritages, central, and is, as I have said above, the site of inquiry through which we intersect our creative practices. This also occurs in my portfolio of compositions where I use my identifications as a method to investigate how notation and live coding intersect. We also focus on other forms of subordination within Wacom and computer music, such as sexism, transphobia, anti-immigrant sentiments, parenthood, etc. By working through these issues, I hope to provide an urgent reason to rethink Wacom and computer music pedagogy, creative and research practices, thus aligning the project with the social justice aspect of Collins, Solorzano, and Yoso's frameworks. One aspect I am excited about exploring is being able to provide policy recommendations for universities and conservatory programs who may be interested in dismantling their white structures within composition and sound art programs. Methods. The final part of this section will briefly go over the mixed methods of the project and reaffirm why my own positionality as a researcher participant is important to the study. The methods include interviewing six Latino X sound artists, a survey sent to Wacom programmers, and a portfolio of compositions. 
In the interviews, I asked questions about how the participants came into their practice before moving on to various identities and experiences they wished to speak about. In all instances, there were more stories than there was time. I limited the interviews to between one and two hours. The participants ranged the participants range in racial, ethnic, and cultural heritages, including Dominican American, Puerto Rican American, Mexican American, Latino X, Chicana, Chicano, Chicana X, etc. I let the participants define their own language, so I do not provide definitions for any identities. It all came from them. They ranged in ages from 20s through to 40s. Two participants are trans, three are cis women, one is cis male. Educational background ranges from having a bachelor's in music through to a PhD in music at both conservatories and universities. I transcribed the interviews using NoScribe and built a narrative portrait of each participant from that transcript. The programming survey was sent to anyone who programs historical and contemporary Wacom music, and I did a call out through social media and emailed people directly um, asking them to fill out the survey. The survey further contextualizes um, the participants' experiences in Wacom, so we have some data from that. The portfolio of compositions chronicles the evolution of my own practice and explores identification as a method of composition. It is in the portfolio where I specifically use neuroqueer and disabled informed creative methods to inform my own practice and to let my identities define how and what I compose. I explore this further in um, the conclusion. The data from all methods is then presented in an autobiographical form in what Solorzano and Yosel call a counter composite narrative which draw on various forms of data to recount the racialized, sexualized, and classed experiences of people of color. Page 33. The liminal transcultural space the study focuses on includes both the space between a person's identification and their practice and the space between themselves and their environment. And to some extent, we also examine the psychosocial the space between the psychosocial. Um, it is in these spaces, I argue, that cognitive dissonances may occur in the form of dialectical tensions. My own positionality and background includes being a first-generation Mexican-American, mestizex, brown, Latinx, non-binary, queer sexuality, um, neurodivergence via CPTSD, Although it's not diagnosed, I'm fairly certain I am autistic. Uh, I um, struggle with dyslexia, um, especially when I'm tired. Um, but it happens all the time. I capitalize on my own marginality here and the set of knowledges I have acquired from my own lived experience to empathize with the participants and ultimately amplify their stories and experiences while being careful of my own biases. I hope I have made my case clearly and effectively for the need to consider using alternative methodologies in practice arts-based research within Wacom and computer music. My methodological framework attempts to center perspectives which have historically been ignored and erased through systematic and generational epistemic ignorance and white effective mechanisms I hope that by using an intersectional interpretive paradigm complemented with the epistemic and ontological assumptions articulated above, I can show the urgency in needing to use these tools to undo how white supremacy has and continues to affect what we study, learn, research, and perform. This methodology aims not only for increased representation within academia, but also for a comprehensive and meaningful reconfiguration of our pedagogy, research, and creative practices. Instead of merely repackaging the familiar themes of EDI, equity, inclusion, and diversity, it strives to avoid the trap of white effective neutrality that has entrenched our fields since time immemorial. Thus, the aim of the project is not only to study the lives and experiences of the participants and my own but to use our stories to provide a method of accessible resistance for fundamental change. Below, I share one of the narrative portraits and preliminary results.
Preliminary Results of Elena's Narrative Portrait In this section, I will share one of the narrative portraits, followed by the analysis, where I show the framework from above in practice. The name of the composer has been changed for anonymity. We began our Zoom session on a cold and windy day in Glasgow. It was mid-May 2023, yet the temperature ranged from between 5 and 12 degrees C's. Evelina kept her video feed off because it was the early morning in her time zone, and she was staying in a hotel. She had been traveling to hear the rehearsal of a new piece. I kept my video feed on and looked at the camera as though I could see her face. Though I could not read Evelina's body language, from her voice I sensed kindness, confidence, and subtle humor. We began our session with one question. I'd love to hear about how you got started with classical music. From there, Avelina shared her story. I constructed the following narrative portrait from that session. Avelina's narrative portrait. I joined, middle sc I joined the middle school band playing flute, but then moved to trombone because I had a lot of trouble making a sound on the flute. I then decided to go to college for music education. While at college, I started composing and quickly moved from the education focus to the composition focus. The first piece I wrote that was more than just a 30-second ditty was a draft of an orchestral piece. I also wrote a wind quintet thing, which are two of the worst things you to write when you're just beginning. It's not like they were terrible, terrible pieces, but it was actually really helpful, and that it forced me to learn orchestration really quickly. There's a lot of stuff I'd write for strings and chamber music that I wouldn't touch in an orchestral piece. I'm not going to try to get 10 people to try to bow their tailpiece in the same way. No, that's not happening. Two of the most rewarding recent experiences for me have been working with the International Contemporary Ensemble and the New World Symphony down in Miami. These were really good experiences. One of the ensembles is there more for pedagogical purposes in addition to the artistic purpose. I'm having to make a piece to serve both of these different groups. One is a large chamber group, so it is still chambering, and you can talk to the players. Most of the players are orchestra or orchestra players right next to the international contemporary ensemble players. There's a little bit of line walking that's required because you're not sure what kind of things or techniques they might be familiar with and which ones they're not. For me, when I compose, there's the artistic intent of a piece and also not a commercial intent. I don't know, where is a niche that this piece can fit intent? I imagine, for example, a solo flute piece and whether it could get done by college flutist or a professional. Should it be 80% for a college flutist and 20% for professionals? That's ridiculous. I like thinking about my composing in this way because I don't want young flutists to hear a piece and then be put off by my music by failing. Then it's not going to be fun for them or me. I don't tend to have a strong consistency in notation because I know some things that are just fully notated, especially the larger the ensemble. But then as you get into chamber and solo stuff, like I have a piece for guitar that is just a graphics score with six small two-line staffs of stuff each for each of the movements, which is pretty far in the direction of not notated because there's nothing representational or allusion to standard notation. Versus other stuff that's just fully notated. In general, it tends more towards the notated side, but it stretches out a bit. And I mean, there's improvised parts and stuff within mostly notated pieces too, but even within a piece, it can vary quite a bit. Rehearsal time and money tend to affect this, unless they're college orchestras, because if they're a professional group, then obviously everyone has to be paid for everything that's up there. And you know they have Brahms to rehearse, so gotta get going with that. The other part I was going to say for previous experiences is to speak that is I just got back from a reading with an orchestra, which was a really, really good experience. The cohort was all black and Latina artists, I was actually the only Latina artist and the other three featured composers were black. But a lot of what we were talking about was about notation and the kind of implicit limits of the orchestra because this is something that we were all running up against in different ways. It's kind of interesting because I was just having a lot of conversations about this and how rehearsal time limits things and there's a certain guise of objectivity and impartiality to it that allows for what we call systemic racism. It's not necessarily the most pernicious kind, but it is still to some degree systemic racism 
Our conductor can reject a piece by a composer of color who is coming from a different cultural angle from the perspective of, quote, we don't have enough time to rehearse this, quote. And because they do that, it's fair. It's a fair thing for that person. But because they did that and the 50 conductors before them also did that, the players never learned how to play music in that style or how to approach those things in a way that they did with the same kind of familiarity that they might approach something like Brahms or Shostakovich. The way that Western notation works for rhythm is just not very good. Rhythm is organized in a lot of other cultures by a pulse map, by identifiable rhythms that have specific names, or can either be cell rhythms that are put together into something. Those kinds of rhythm structures, where it's a set of specific rhythms over a period of time, a series of pulses, just doesn't work with the Western conception of notation. Where it is about meter, which isn't rhythm, but a background layer of it. This frame doesn't work when the actual organizing principle is the specific rhythm being played over the course of 17 pulses that may be regular or irregular. As a result, the notation is pretty terrible at working with those kinds of things. You're often not working with the kind of the same regular stuff. Like it goes okay with the rhythms that do fit in within, like um, a Western metrical structure. For anything that's extended structure, it doesn't work. It only works for those kind of microstructures. And then you're trying to reconstruct larger rhythmic structures from these things, and they don't always line up. Or to make them line up, you have to start using things that in Western notation are like, quote unquote, weird. And rhythm, style, and articulation, I mean, the style thing is to some degree always a really big thing. I can write notes that might be the notes that you would hear in a style. But if you're not playing them in that way, then it's just, I think, well, we've all heard people who don't really know how to play jazz. I was also just thinking in the lens of heritage for a bit. I'm Mexican too, in some way. It influences the kind of things I end up picking a lot of times, and it's just a function of time. Sometimes you don't have time to get into a whole thing, so you don't. It's unfortunate, but it's also true. Trying to explain things that people don't know anything about, like from my heritage, there's a certain degree to which it's not possible and you have to dumb things down or you have to have a lot of time. And as an emerging composer, you don't really get that time. So a lot of times, the thing that is easiest and most expeditious to use in composing is the more European influenced thing. I like to use the word waltz, for example, because it is in the style of the colonizer which makes it more affable to the settings I'm in. And the further away you get from this, like mariachi, it's just a function of time, as I said earlier. The less notated piece is, the more you're making a performance practice for that piece. If it's a completely non-notated piece, you can also develop a performance practice across your work if you're doing non-notated pieces in similar ways. It's a pretty big ask when you ask someone to play a Beethoven piece, a performance practice that has had hundreds of years to develop, a performer in our world today can tap into it very easily. But you don't necessarily have that same kind of thing for contemporary composers, especially ones that are working in different kinds of traditions. Performers are often not brought up in. Most of the dumbing down happens implicitly in the compositional process. A lot of times it's a subconscious filtering. I only bother thinking of ideas that I can do because it would be too torturous to think of an idea that you couldn't do. It's not so much in reaction to something as it is like a preemptive thing. It's not necessarily from one experience, but it's like across pieces. Like I do something in one piece, and if that gets some pushback in the future, I don't have ideas that are like that anymore. A lot of times it's rhythmic. I had this thing that happened with one orchestra. There was a rhythm with nested tuplets, and some of the players were just not having it. And it's always the stuff where the rhythm isn't actually that complicated. It's in 3-4 with some nested tuplets nested in triplets. It's not a difficult rhythm to hear or feel, but it looks bad on the page because it doesn't line up and stuff. Because Western notation, you can't just say it starts here and it stops there. It has to be within this regular defined thing but it's mostly to do with just how it looks on the page because it was an immediate reaction. I got an anonymous comment from one of the violists of the group saying, quote, it's absurdly rhythmically complex and isn't necessary, end quote. 
I mean, the comment from the violist isn't necessary. For me, the funniest is salation of this whole situation. And what I thought to myself is, quote, no, of course not. We're playing contemporary classical music. Nothing we're doing is strictly necessary, quote. Like the only necessary-ness around any of this is the one that we create. So what is their comment? My rhythm is necessary because that's the rhythm in the piece, and we're here to do the piece. There is no existential necessariness to that, or any specific rhythm, or any specific piece. That's how literally all composing ever works. Not that it's necessary, but you have to make decisions about what you're doing, and those things are the piece. When it comes to racism, a lot of times... There may be a slight feeling of condescension when people tell me, quote, oh, you did a really good job. Most of my experiences in this, because I haven't been doing this for very long, don't come from organizational issues, but more so from audiences and the general classical world. It can be painful when you're also in some ways beholden to audiences and donors who are often the groups that are most likely to harm you in a bigoted way. And you have to be beholden to them and interact with them and stuff. You have to play the game. It's not even so much about if something does or doesn't happen. It's just that having to think about the possibility of it happening is just always mentally stressful and tiring. And it shouldn't have to be. Because there is the possibility of that at all times. And the fact that you don't even know if you're be able to do anything if something happens or if you're just going to have to sit there and not say anything as someone just goes on some on some goes on some racist fucking tangent i think for me especially as a person who's an emerging composer i don't know if this is just in my head and i'm consciously aware of this but like a lot of times if someone breaks out in some kind of way with a piece you'd better be willing to write something like it five more times or ten more times and have it be something that people identify you with. And the danger of it is, if you get pigeonholed as some type of thing related to your identity, it is endless and inescapable. And I don't know, I may be subjecting, subjugating myself to the powers that be, but if you become that trans woman composer who writes about being a trans woman, to a lot of people, that is all you will ever be. And anything you want to say about anything else isn't valid, but if you your first breakout piece is free from anything, then you can write pieces about being trans a bunch. Then people won't assume all you do is write pieces about being a trans woman. You don't get commissioned for pieces that you haven't written in a very large sense. When people commission you, they often base their decision on what you've done before. And they're not writing to commission from something that is completely different than that. They're doing the commission for a piece that's in that general idea. So what they think of you is as relevant in terms of what you get commissioned for. If people think of you as a composer where the Latina identity is very important, then that's what you'll get commissioned for. If people think of you as a composer where gender is really important to you, that's what you get commissioned for and so on. And I don't know, obviously that's a part of who I am, but it also feels like there's a certain ghettoization around that. And I don't want to like feel... Like, I'm stuck having to write about things even when I don't want to write about them. My thing for DEI is there's two different threads, or maybe like polarities of DEI stuff, and there's a certain kind of spectrum, and the spectrum is between what a lot of people in the majority groups miss about the function of DEI. You are meant to celebrate the artists that are being involved through this, but DEI itself is not a celebration. The whole reason DEI exists is because of hundreds of years of racism and sexism. Don't celebrate that you've been doing DEI initiative for five years. The whole reason that you're doing a DEI initiative is because you're working on a bed of hundreds of years of white supremacy. DEI is reparations, not a fun Sunday club. Analysis of Avelina's Narrative Portrait Avelina, in her interview, shares many identifications with me, including Latina, Mexican, trans woman, emerging composer, and artist. 
Of particular note is how Evelina negotiates her identifications within her Wacom career. It is important to her that the industry, audiences, ensembles, conductors, etc. know her as a composer first and foremost. The rest of her identifications are secondary and she will only use them under the right circumstances. Avelina notes, quote, The danger of it is, if you get pigeonholed as some type of thing related to your identity, it is endless and inescapable. Maybe I'm subjugating myself too much to the powers that be, but if you become that, quote, trans woman composer who writes about being a trans woman, to a lot of people that's all you will ever be, and anything you want to say about anything else isn't valid, end quote. Here she describes what I argue is a white effective mechanism that directly interferes with her identification and sub subsequently affects what she will and will not compose. An absence of identification is forced in Avelina because of the way minoritarian identifications are fetishized, prejudiced, and or othered. This creates a forced distance between Avelina and her minoritarian identifications in heritage, culture, and gender within her creative practice and her career. Avelina elaborates further how she is segregated from her identities. It does not occur in one instance, but through a series of moments in her career. She says, quote, trying to explain things that people don't know anything about, like for my Mexican heritage, there's a certain degree to which it's not possible, or you have to have a lot of time. And as an emerging composer, you don't really get that time. So a lot of times, the thing that is easiest and most expeditious to use in composing is the more European influence thing. I like to use the word waltz, for example, because it is in the style of the colonizer. Avelina here experiences a type of forced cultural assimilation due to the limited amount of time and the epistemic ignorance Wickham has for Mexican musical performance practices. It is not the case that one person is telling her to assimilate into whiteness, but rather the assimilation occurs through subtle cultural norms within Wacom, such as the limited amount of, of rehearsal time given to emergency composers, emerging com composers, the lack of knowledge the musicians hold of Mexican music practices, and the fear of how one may be perceived if you do ask a musician to do something that is Mexican in style. We can also begin to understand this more meaningfully by intersecting her gender through her heritage. The Donna 2021-22 report notes that of the 20,400 compositions scheduled that season, only 2.1% were by BIPOC women, and as far as I know, no statistics exist on trans women composers specifically. 87.7% were written by white men. We can see the real-world impact of that 2.1% allocated to BIPOC women, such as Avelina, through her narrative portrait. This includes how Wickham's epistemic ignorance of Mexican musical performance practices put an additional strain on what and how Avelina is able to use rehearsal time. Despite Mexican music being a product of Spain's colonization and therefore an extension of the urological, Mexican music performance practices are widely ignored within the U.S. Wickham sector. She describes the tension and frustration of existing in this white liminal space when she says, quote, sometimes you don't have time to get into a whole thing, so you don't, and you have to dumb things down, end quote. The limited resources allocated to her in the sector permit her from even attempting to compose with her unique epistemologies and ontologies. Instead, she must use, quote, this style of the white colonizer, end quote. In doing so, unfortunately, she is forced into the sector's complicity of epistemic ignorance. This is a direct consequence of the white effective mechanism and what causes forced epistemic self-harm. Not only are we made to submit by white effectivity, but we then become complicit in our own identities, destruction, and help to support the next generation's subordination. When Avelina is forced to let go of her ident own identifications, she is being forced to submit to the white racial frame. This frame has had several hundreds years to develop and continues to hold a monopoly on the Wacom composition epistemologies and ontologies, both at conservatories and universities as well as throughout the professional sector. How are emerging composers like Avelina supposed to exist as themselves in these negativity in relation circumstances? She says, quote, 
When you ask someone to play a Beethoven piece, a performance practice that has had hundreds of years to develop, a performer in our world today can tap into it very easily, but you don't necessarily have the same kind of thing for contemporary composers, end quote. Avelina articulates the difficulty of trying to form your own compositional style when you have minoritarian identifications that you may wish to engage with in your practice. Unfortunately, the white male gaze still has a severe impact on her practice by controlling her through various effective means. This causes an absence of identification in circumstances where there is a very real danger she may be verbally and or physically assaulted. She says, Quote, it can be painful when you are also in some ways beholden to audiences and donors who are often the groups that are most likely to harm you in a bigoted way, and you have to be beholden to them and interact with them and stuff. You have to play the game. It's not even so much about if someone if something does or doesn't happen. It's just that having to think about the possibility of it happening is just always mentally stressful and tiring, end quote. This experience of hypervigilance hyper vigilance is common amongst many people who have immigrated to the U.S., but it is also well documented amongst queer, trans, and non-binary communities who often have to interact with conservative communities, such as Wecom. Intersectionality will help us to understand that Avelina may be experiencing hypervigilance due to both her heritage and gender identities when in Wecom spaces. The white effective mechanisms in Avelina's narrative impact her compositional practice, rehearsal space, psychological and physical well-being, and how she markets and labels herself. These mechanisms cause rifts to form between who she is and who she must be to play the game and succeed in the industry. Conclusion, research implications, and final thoughts. Congrats, you made it. It's an hour and 40 minutes long. In this article, I have made a case for the importance of using identification as a research method, or at least as a tool leading in the creation of it. I began my study wanting to investigate the relationship between identification and one's creative practice. This project is inevitably about how Latino X artists experience, perceive, act, and move through Wacom and computer music. I quickly realized that a reflexive methodology and methods would be necessary, and one that carried with it the epistemological and ontological assumptions of the Latino X community. Winter, 2001, through her sociogenic philosophy, provided the initial justification for studying minoritarian perspectives by a minoritarian researcher, a researcher capable of understanding, quote, the aberration of affect induced in the black by the massive psycho existential complex in which they find themselves entrapped page 54 which inevitably inevitably influences influences our sense of self and the development of our racial consciousness page 95 collins through black feminist thought provided the epistemological and ontological assumptions necessary to recognize and validate the participants claims alongside and with their identification and i hope these will be used in the um, validation process of my phd as well an intersectional interpretive paradigm allows for further nuance in the interpretation of the data finally a methodological framework combining anzaldua collins and critical race methodology methodology provides the necessary foundations to do the research crm consists of five elements including the intercentricity of race and racism with other forms of subordination, the challenge to dominant ideology, the commitment to social justice, the centrality of experiential knowledge, and the transdisciplinary perspective. I weave together these very various lineages to uncover what it is like to be Latino X in Wecom and computer music today. One of the major implications to have come from my PhD project is to have developed a compositional method which uses identification as method, or at least as a means for generative creative output. Many of the participants and myself describe various ways we have had to negotiate our identifications in the compositional practice, resulting in epistemic self-harm, dialectical tensions, and a forced distancing between ourselves and our identifications, our histories, our cultures, etc. 
To avoid this, I have developed a method which centers an identification or group of identities and from which I let influence the score, form, instrumentation, rhythm, performers, etc. I can loosely describe the method through several steps below, though I am still developing and refining it. Step one, I first pick an identity or group of identities I want to focus on. Step two, I research these identities in various ways, from reading about them, reading about historical genealogies, listening to other works um, by artists who self-identify in similar ways, reading biographies, poetry, nonfiction, films, discussion with friends and colleagues, through self-reflection, all kinds. Three, I refined and reflect on what my identities mean to me within the context of the work I am building. Four, I then select the type of score that would best suit the identities and the research that I've been doing. Five, perhaps at this stage I begin to outline goals for the piece that have to do with audience reception, my own artistic goals, texts I would use, um, or a library of sounds that I want to explore or am thinking about. Six, I then begin exploring the sounds, text, drawings, visuals, or whatever, and perhaps begin to build short sections of what could be in the piece. The form has become self-evident at this stage, at least in what I've done. Um, so whether it's going to be um, you know, Im improv or devised or free form, or it's going to be a little more structured and repetitive, um, etc., um, step seven, at this point, I begin to consider possible venues that would suit the work best based on the goals I identified in step three. This may also impact the form of the piece and other organizing principles. I also begin to consider the target audience and how best to perform the piece for them, which may inform the venue choice and other aspects of the piece. Step eight, from these, I organically construct larger sections until I have a sense of the internal logic of the piece. And step nine, I finish the piece and perform it at a chosen location. I break down this process in my PhD through the various portfolio pieces. An example of this can be seen in my piece, Violent Accumulation Part 1, see 2023B if you'd like to um, see it. I choose to work with my... I, in this piece, I chose to work with my identities in Wacom composition institutions. Um, I chose to work with anti-assimilationist logics, my Latinx background, and Misty Hicks. And specifically, forms of resistance and protest I have inherited from these identities. Less so the institutions, but more so the other ones. My goal was to disrupt concerts with all-white and or all-male composers at the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland, or RCS. I ended up choosing the Zine form for the score, which has a history of resistance amongst many marginalized communities. The Zine is eight pages long, including the back and front covers. The back cover features the drag queen Divine. On the front are three pictures of Haydn and a screenshot of an all Haydn concert at RCS. Inside are statistics from the Donna 2021-2022 report, which focuses on how little performance time BIPOC composers get, I think it's something like 2.1% out of 20,000 pieces. There is text -based, There is a text-based score inside that invites people to interrupt concerts with all white and or all male programs, composer programs. The score instructs people to begin reading James Baldwin, Nobody Knows My Name, or In Search of a Majority, until the whiteness has been destroyed. The piece has been banned at RCS since December 5th, 2023. Um, it is March 13th, just for context, 2024. Vicky Gunn, the academic registrar, notified me at a meeting that any performances of the piece would violate the rules and codes of RCS that I had apparently agreed to follow. If I were to perform it, if I were to perform my piece, which would interrupt uh, you know, the Haydn concert, she would need to follow through with consequences because I would have disrupted the learning environment of the orchestra. I would have shamed people for their complicity in white supremacist behavior. This includes students and staff. And I could have caused damage to staff and students' dignity at work and study. I see this as a white effective mechanism that has made me submit 
to the white supremacist pathology of the institution. Or I risk being terminated or suspended from the program. No action was taken as Vicky realized that rules and codes, or that the rules and the codes affectionately named the Red Book, which it is a giant red book. I was handed a giant red book at this meeting. Um, these had never been shared with PhD students, so I was unaware um, and you know, I wasn't intentionally breaking rules. Uh, um, they did ask me in the meeting if I was intentionally breaking, and I was like, well, no. <laughs> One of the reasons why I was doing it is because I thought I could explore protest with art through art, but you can't offend the sensitivities of white people, now can you? <laughs> From this, we can see that there are also implications for my PhD study about conservatoire and university policies that need to be reviewed and changed to support true equity rather than performative EDI policies that continue to uphold white supremacy. While RCS may have made me submit by threatening the continuation of my doctorate degree, we can see the racist logics behind their actions by using intersectionality and the framework I have built. All white and or all male concerts are unquestioned and fully supported by senior management. The epistemic ignorance in these events, as well as that of syllabi and all well, all white departments, um, is not recognized as problematic. At least, if it is, they're not show, they're not expressing it. Um, I never imagined I would be using this to describe a situation at my institution for my PhD project. But it is clear to me that RCS senior management's response to violent accumulation, the zine, effectively ended my PhD's line of protest informed inquiry. In my portfolio, I had explored anti assimilationism, anti assimilationism, race, gender, disability, and protest and resistance. One staff member has anonymously admitted to me that the conservatoire must care for their white conservative, conservative patrons who prefer all white and all male composers. I'm astounded that this would be presented as like a neutral, okay option. Okay, I'm not surprised, but I'm also like, wow, you don't see it, do you? This experience for me ended my PhD's intellectual endeavors and any possibility of further inquiry in through with RCS. I didn't write this in the paper. Actually, for this conclusion section, I've said a lot of things I didn't write in the paper, but I've straight up just like, I don't go to RCS anymore because it's it's weird to be in a place that doesn't support you. And at this fucking meeting, I was asked how they could best support me. And my response was, you literally can't. You have chosen to defend white supremacy with the current, inst I think, I think what I said was, you cannot, given the current institutional logics. I don't know what the fuck they were expecting me to say, but I was like, no, you can't. Okay, continuing with the paper. Pierre Baye and Atadiwala, 2018, offer fantastic advice to white-led orchestras and, by extension, to other white-led new music organizations about how to provide equitable and inclusive opportunities when collaborating with BIPOC musicians. By extension, if we viewed collaborators here as students, so senior management collaborating with students, they might be able to learn something. Atariwala writes, the two most significant terms that underpin the current situation facing Canadian orchestras are systemic inequity and coloniality and the wide spectrum of ensuing problematics from hierarchical structures which reinforce sexism and racism to exoticism and cultural appropriation to universality and internationalism, page five. And she asks orchestras to ponder important questions, including who belongs in the orchestra and whose music belongs in the orchestra. What is the relationship between orchestras and other musical cultures? Can these, can those relationships exist equitably and according to current definitions of cultural ownership and sovereignty? Atariwala also implicates administrative teams when she writes, while administrators describe a sense of helplessness, helplessness in cultivating diversity in their orchestras, pointing to the untouchability of the screened audition or the pipeline of training and education, 
Atariwala argues that orchestral administrators and artistic directors have agency in defining the vision of what the art form could be in Canada. This is an important reminder that I think we often forget when attempting to do EDI work and something RCS just doesn't give a fuck about. I have consulted with many new music organizations and universities with EDI development in informal and formal settings. I have yet to see one of them implement the suggestions I and my teammates in these projects have suggested. In one example, an organization hired an all-white board of trustees. This was after having had many laborious conversations with them in the span of two years. In the article, I then um, just sort of give about nine different suggestions from Atariwala and Pierre Baez's report. Some of them are just letting a guest artist define the rehearsal project, letting guest artists talk to musicians instead of having to go through the conductor, making sure there's extra time for rehearsals, especially if, for example, you're working, you know, an orchestra is working with an indigenous artist and the work isn't written, it's devised, and so you need more time to do it. Um, but an interesting one I thought was encouraging students to be bi or multi-musical proficient within universities and conservatories. So instead of just having students be really good at Beethoven, why not that and something else? Or three other things which would dramatically reimagine who we hired in these spaces. Um, many of these recommendations work to subvert the white effective mechanisms I have identified in my study, and I hope that more organizations begin to consider them. As Avelina said in her interview, the whole reason DEI exists is because of hundreds of years of racism and sexism. DEI is reparations, not a Sunday fun club. Finally, these experiences have led me to believe that we need more white people studying whiteness and dealing with their own cultural affects instead of continuing to live in the safety of white neutrality. I am tired of measuring whiteness for white people, for anyone. I am tired of having to exist in opposition to it. I am tired of being labeled a complainer only for my intellectual and emotional logics to be dismissed. I am tired of being angry. I am tired of all of it. How can we ever exist as ourselves when whiteness affords white people and those living in whiteness a place to hide? We know that identities are sites from which we perceive, act, and engage with others. We know this. And Alcove does begin to form a philosophy of whiteness in her book, Visible Identities, Race, Gender, and the Self. I believe my research here shows the urgency white researchers and artists in Wacom and Computer Music need to begin wrestling with what whiteness is, work through whatever shame there is, work to understand what whiteness needs to survive, and to help continue dismantling it. It is white affect that has proven to be one of the biggest hurdles faced by the participants in my study and the biggest obstacle I have faced in my PhD, whether through the writing, research, or creative process. More work must be done in this area, and it must be done by white people. Thank you.